this is my other hat um, in, in in the transplant setting. So we, we saw a couple of, and we're dealing with those hearts. The whole session has been on the hearts um, that I'm going to talk about, the, the big dilated hearts with end stage heart failure, with mitral regurgitation, um, and uh, people with very poor quality of life. What, what can we do for them? Um, and this is, just, this is an interesting slide. This is, this is US data. It looks at heart failure prevalence. Um, and projected out to 2030 with, with females and males, and, and it's pretty staggering. Heart failure is a big problem, um, and there's a lot of it out there, and I'm not sure we're, we're on top of it. Um, if you look at probably the gold standard for, for end-stage heart failure, sorry, this doesn't project very well, is um, transplantation, and at St Vincent's we're very, very proud of our transplant program. Um, and, and the results track fairly well. And just to put it in context, the, the, the little cloud there um, is the actuarial survival of people on medical management. So if you have end stage heart failure that ends you up on a transplant waiting list and you don't get that transplant, um, your actuarial survival at two years is 25%. So transplant is a good solution and people, and it's getting better. Um, but there's the problem. Uh, we can only ever do so many transplants. We're not a very, um, for whatever reason, we're not a very generous nation when it comes to donors. Uh, we're getting better since the Kevin Rudd time, but if you look at Spain, they get about 30 to 40 donors per million people, whereas Australia, um, at least we're better than New Zealand or something, but we're, we're about 10. Um, we're, now, we're, now, we're now more than that. Uh, we're now about 50, between 15 and 20. Um, and that's for various reasons that I'll, I'll touch on. So as I said, we're actually getting better for various reasons um, in, in terms of donation, but it's, it's hard to know why the, the actual, um, why, why those rates are such that they are. Um, in, in places like Spain, everyone is a donor until they say they're not. So it's an opt-out system. So um, whereas in Australia and, and, and a lot of other places, you have to declare that you're a donor. Um, and of course, family can overrule it. So it's a very sensitive area, and and, um, and we understand the difficulties. Um, how do we expand that donor pool with with little toys like this? This is a um, transmedic uh, cardiac perfusion system. You can get one for the lungs, and I'll show you some videos later. So now we can take organs and, and put them on this system. We can take a heart, we can put it on this system, and we can get it working. Um, and what that means is if, if you have a heart when you take it from a donor and you put it in the esky, um, you've got four hours before your mortality starts doubling to, to get that into the recipient and, and get it working. So it makes it very difficult when you've got a donor from Darwin or from Perth or from Townsville. Um, so our, our, and, and despite our average ischemic times, it's called being very high, our results are very good. Um, and that's a testament to our, our physicians and our um, yeah, our physicians for, for, for what they do and what I'm about to show you. So th this, is, this is the, now for some reason these videos have come out very poorly. This is in the animal lab. Um, so we can put um, pig's hearts on these machines, pig's hearts that weren't working and we can, we can resuscitate them and make them, make them work better and then go on to transplant them. Um, we can then take an organ, um, and this was the first DCD heart transplant, so we can take a heart that, that's actually stopped. Uh, we can put it on this machine, we can resuscitate it, we can get it working, we can, we can determine that it's gonna work in the donor, and then we can go on and transplant it. So we were the first in the world to do that um, uh, from that particular type of donor, and we've done um, 13, 13 of them to date, another one today. Um, and uh, that certainly increased our donor pool. Um, so there's all sorts of ways of ex expanding the donor pool. We're never gonna get enough donors to deal with the problem, and that's where ventricular assist devices come in. They're little pumps that are attached to the, to the ventricle and take over the pumping action of the heart. Um, we've come a long way in terms of how they've been designed and how they work. The ones on the, the uh, over here is the, the, the original workhorse, the HeartMate 1. Um, I made two device, which was a big device about the size of a dinner plate that weighed a kilogram. You'd implant it in someone's abdomen and you'd connect it up. It had lots of working parts which would break, valves would wear out. Um, 
and now now they're down to devices that we've we've uh, used quite regularly. You can see you can fit into the palm of the hand, and the other device over here is about the size of a battery, which we're just trialling at the moment. So it's come a long way. They've gone from pulsatile devices, which which create a heartbeat, to now continuous flow devices. So they're just like the little pump on your fish tank. Um, and so patients with one of these devices in don't have a pulse um, because they've got a continuous blood flow from the pump. And the VAD programs are such that now um, it's, not, it's not good enough just to get a survivor. We want a survivor 80% to two years, 80, 90% to two years. So the pumps are getting very good um, and, and we're looking to apply them earlier in people that aren't on death's door, which is the part of the problem with, with mechanical assist at the moment. Um, so as I said, we're looking from moving from these critically ill patients in cardiogenic shock. They might have balloon pumps in, they're on inotropes. Um, they look like that mitraclip patient. You know, the hearts are just finished. They're renal, they've got renal failure, they could be on ECMO. Um, and, it, and it really is um, a flip of a coin whether you can get them through a procedure, uh, uh, even, even putting a VAT in. And now we want to move to these people who are what we call the walking wounded. So they're in heart failure, they're coming into hospital on inotropes um, for regular tune-up. Slowly their renal function's going off, but if we put a device into them early, um, we, can, we can stave off that renal failure, we can get them in good shape, and then we can get them to the transplant in, in a good and timely manner. Um, and if you ask patients who are sick um, and have got heart failure, whether they're willing to consider a mechanical device, um, they're very open to it. And, um, and, and this, this, this was an interesting study here. Obviously, the sicker they are, the more willing they are to have a pump put in them. Um, so, and these are people with devices in. They live normal lives, albeit with a little battery pack um, that they walk around with, but um, most, all, all of our patients go home. Um, they're not meant to drive, but they do. Um, and they fly around the place. They got their cigarette, they plug into their cigarette lighters. They, they do all sorts of things, but they've gone from, you know, sitting in chairs doing nothing to, to living an active life. And, and this is one of the earlier ads you can see in this woman where where it would actually come out the chest and it would, the pump would sit on your, on, your, on your tummy or you'd drag it around with a big shopping trolley um, to now just a single line that comes out so I could be standing here with a device in me and you wouldn't know. And soon that would be totally re implantable, which is uh, going to be another fascinating thing. I'm just going to quickly flick through some, some videos uh, real quick because I know everyone wants to get home. Um, they're not that hard to put in. Um, or the, the trick is getting them in early and getting them into patients who are going to tolerate it, um, the, the insult of it all. It's done through a stenotomy. Um, we have to connect the pump up beforehand. We, we sew a little ring um, to, the, to the ventricular apex um, and, that's, and you can see that being tied in there. And of course the cardiologists have, will work out a way to put one of these in with a catheter. So <laughs> we've, we've, we don't well, I don't do a stenotomy all the time now. I can do them through a sort of minimally invasive approach. So I make a little cut here and a little cut here and put the pump in here and then connect it up to the aorta here. So I can do it without a stenotomy. Um, whether that's an advance, um, I'm not sure, but there's a trial going on at the moment, which we're part of. Um, you have to core out the ventricle, so you, you, you cut a little hole in the middle of the ring and you use this sort of medieval device and you, um, it's quite nerve-wracking to push into the heart and then you, you pop it and then pull out a little core of, um, of muscle. Um, then you clean up the ventricle, you make sure there's no thrombus in there, then you take the pump, you flush it with a bit of saline or glucose and um, let the heart fill up and join it on. So as you can see, it's not very hard. <laughs> Anyone can do it. <laughs> Um, and then, then you sew the outflow graft to the aorta um, and then you tunnel the, the drive line out um, to bring it out uh, wherever the patient wants it actually. We ask them you know, whether they're left or right handed, which side they sleep on, um, silly things like that, but it, but it all matters. And uh, as I touched on, this is the Achilles heel of it. This is how infection gets into them. Um, uh, so there, there are new devices that will come out in the future where they're totally implantable. So we'll implant the controller, we'll Im like, a, like a, a defib box, we'll implant um, a battery and that battery will be recharged transcutaneously. So like you put your iPhone next to your bed and it charges through 
some sort of magic without touching something, so will these devices. So you'll be totally tetherless. And that's what you want the tether to look like. Um, you come off the, the heart-lung machine and the, it's, it's quite a satisfying operation. All of a sudden the circulation is good. Um, you stop the bleeding and then go home. So the, the pumps are getting smaller, they're getting more reliable. They still have a few issues in terms of thrombosis. They're difficult to manage from an anticoagulation point of view and thrombosis and stroke is an issue. Um, but, uh, but as I said, compared to the alternative, uh, they're a very good solution. Um, there are devices that are going to be able to be placed transapical and we've trialled these in the, in the lab. Um, so see the cardiologists are coming at us. Um, so on a beating heart, just like exactly like the tendine, um, we'll core a little hole in the ventricle and pop one of these pumps in um, and that'll uh, take over the circulation. Um, so they're getting smaller, the peripherals are getting very good and they're getting totally implantable. So thank you very much. <laughs>